morning, good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> Every time I, I see one of my lives, you know, come back up after in the recording and I hear how I started, I think surely I can come up with a better way of starting my videos than, than that, but it is just what comes out. So ooh, I'm going to um, just put my phone on silent. So um, we have a fabulous guest coming in at 10 o'clock this morning. And until that time, I've got a couple of things that I wanted to go over to cover. One is after our beautiful um, garden tour that I did with you the other morning, which was quite spontaneous and fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I, I talked about doing something similar and showing you um, in this reconnection to nature and spirit series um, about connecting to um, sorry using um, the the skincare and the makeup that I use so I thought about how I was going to do this and um, try to set up the camera in my bathroom and it just all felt a bit clunky like it wasn't going to work so what I thought I would do is not to skip over that is just to tell you what I do use. Um, I don't have any affiliation with these companies and at times I change things. Um, but there is, it's the intentionality in using products that are as natural as humanly possible, organic wherever possible, ethical company companies wherever possible. Um, if I can, I like to use Australian um, because it's, you know, supporting local businesses means a lot to me. But then there's another little thread as well where I have a deep love of story and connection to story and history is also part of what my values and what inspires me to make the decisions I make in the, the way that I shop and the things that I buy. So the skincare that I am currently using, I, I have seen ads come up for this Australian brand called um, Eco Sonia. Um, and I've got uh, quite a few of, of her products now. It is an Australian company. Um, and I bought them originally for one of my children who was having uh, problems with acne and got beautiful results. And it, the products are just gorgeous so I decided to buy um, a bit of a suite of products and absolutely love them absolutely love them um, so I would be very happy to recommend these products there are quite a few you know and it's really just spending a little bit of time doing your own research talk to people ask questions, come into groups like the Vision Builders community and you are very welcome to ask in there, you know, what um, natural organic skincare products are you using? What have you found works for psoriasis or, you know, whatever the skin uh, challenges that you might have, hydration, whatever it is that you're wanting. Good morning, Janet. Whatever it is that you're wanting specifically. For me, it's, you know, it's really hydration. Um, so I love, love, love these products and I've only been using this particular brand for a short period of time now, but I'm really enjoying using them. Um, so that's the first thing. The second uh, thing is makeup and I have been using a brand called Inica for actually many years now. So Inica is uh, an Australian company. They're all organic, mineral-based. Um, I find that with my skin, I really don't like using sort of thick foundations. I actually only started wearing makeup really um, a few years ago, not, not very long ago at all. And wearing like a, um, a liquid foundation always feels really heavy and cakey on my skin. So I just don't like using it. This Inica is a lovely... Um, powder 
and you know just put it's a very light coating that I use um, that has a little bit of an SPF in it as well which when I sit because I sit in front of computers all the time I'm actually not a fan of sunscreen that's a, a there's a lot of information out there about why we don't particularly want to use sunscreens un, except in exceptional circumstances We've got it now got it, you know, this great epidemic of vitamin D deficiencies because everyone's been told to be scared of the sun, another thing to be scared of. But the sun is critically important. We need the sun on our skin and particularly in our eyeballs. So leaving our sun glasses off wherever possible, you know, they're just the little tweaks that actually can make a big difference. So Inica, um, I use and have used and very confidently recommend as an organic Australian makeup company. They are amazing. Um, and when we when I started this conversation, I talked about my love of things that have history and story. And I remember reading some time ago about um, Chanel and the soldiers lining up after returning from war outside Chanel to buy the lipstick for their girlfriends before reuniting with their girlfriends. And it's a, you know, it's a lovely story. If you want to Google it, there's all sorts of stories like this. And about these, these older companies, Dior and Chanel and so on. So there is a luxury element to it, but it is story and history. So I do, and I've become quite well known for my my red lipsticks. And so not necessarily the natural world theme that we're going for, but in in the light of honesty, it's not about me pretending that sometimes I don't use other products because sometimes there is, but it is always with great intention. So having my Dior and my Chanel lipsticks brings that little touch of delight um, to me. And for the women who are lipstick wearers, that sound, they've perfected the click. <laughs> what is it about that satisfying click that you get when you shut an amazing lipstick? I don't know, but it brings me a little bit of joy. Being connected to story and history in things as a, a choice and as an um, intentional thing that really gives us connection um it is how i have this great love of things that are pre-loved and secondhand and so much of my furniture in my house this couch was secondhand these pieces were all antiques and secondhand i love upcycling i love pre-loved it is the best possible choice for our planet without question but it's not only that it's the stories and the intrigue and where did these pieces come from um it is connection to history that just gives me so much delight and in sharing my delight and love of these things i believe i hope that i inspire other people to take on some of this so, you know, and we can apply this to at the clothes that we buy. I have bought some of the most beautiful pieces that I own, clothing pieces from op shops and secondhand stores. You you get, I, I go through first. The first thing I noticed is, I notice always is textures. So finding beautiful soft wools and the most beautiful natural uh, fabrics. I notice color because I love color. Um, and then if it ticks those two boxes, I'll pull it out and have a look at it. And often, you know, I have found the most exquisite and amazing brands, local brands, organic clothing, and so on. So these are ways that I support this philosophy of supporting the natural world. We don't need everything to be new. In fact, it is in buying pre-loved that we get to share um, things with each other, swap clothing with girlfriends and just delight in that. It is our way of combating the extraordinary damage, extraordinary damage that is being done by fast food, uh, fast fashion, the fast fashion industry. So 
they're just some little tweaks. The other thing that I thought would be really worth touching on today was inspired by a conversation I had with one of the fabulous women in my emboldened women's mastermind last night. And this conversation that came up, she has a daughter in primary school who they're doing a fundraiser at the primary school. And the fundraiser involves something that goes against every value that she's wanting to support. It involves a lot of plastics and um, not thoughtful use of connection to what we, you know, to what the children um, could be doing to raise funds. So it is when we get really challenged in wanting to stand firmly in our values to support our own health and the health of the environment when everybody else is making a different decision, that our values and our ability to stand really firmly in our values gets challenged. It is difficult to be the odd one out. It is difficult to feel like you're being the party pooper just this once surely it doesn't matter and the problem is that it is just this once surely it doesn't matter that has led to the predicament that we are in now just this once so every time we allow ourselves to get pulled down into a decision, pulled off course into a decision that is not within our values, that is not supporting our health and the health of our planet, that we are not standing in our personal power to make a difference in the world. And in this conversation, in this space, I really want to invite you to be prepared to be the odd one out. I have been in this position many, many times over many, many years. And there were many times when I thought, I don't want to be this person anymore. I don't want to do this. It feels isolating. It feels hard. I feel alone. I feel like the freak in the room when everybody else is making a different decision. And being a voice for something different is just something that I felt I could not do. And it is only as time has gone by that people have come to me and said, thank you for being the voice that allowed me to make a different decision. We need to be the voice that is prepared to be different to what is normal. What is normal is what has created the picture we are now seeing on this planet. It is our unquenchable desire to fit in, to not stand out. It is our desire to just not have the discomfort of being different to everyone around us. This is the teenager within us the child within us that is still alive and well she gets to be nurtured she gets to be loved but it is the mature woman in us that gets to be the voice of wisdom in the room that gets to have the courage to say do you know what I don't think this is for the greater good of all I don't think this is going to serve my health the health of my family the health of our community be that a school community and the health of the world around us. How do we get to be that voice? Who do I need to be a stand for? And what do I need to be a stand for? And as I think about the women in, in my community, the ones I know personally, the ones I've worked with, we are a mature bunch. We are the voices of wisdom in this world that have enough life experience behind us to know what really matters and what doesn't. And fitting in is no longer the place that we are striving to be. When you have the courage to be the voice of wisdom in the room, you find your people. 
you pull your people forward, the people who will have your back, who will cheer you on, who will encourage you. Sometimes it is the shoulder that you get to lean on and say, this just feels really uncomfortable. I'm tired of being the odd one out. I'm tired of being the voice of difference. When everyone else is saying, it's okay, just this once, surely it doesn't matter. There are a lot of times, you know, whether we are in the, the motherhood phase or the grandmother phase, the auntie phase, it's being the voice that says we don't need plastic toys. These children can gather things from the natural environment that fuels their imagination, their creativity, their, their, their love for building and innovating. This is what builds intelligence in the most successful schools in the world. This, you know, the, the primary years are play-based years. They don't start academic learning until after they're seven. In our Western cultures, this is in, you know, Finland and in Steiner educations, but in our Western cultures, we're trying to jam academic learning into our children by sitting them in one place and getting them, you know, consume, you know reading things off boards and computers. This is not how children learn best, in my opinion, in my observation. It is in being out in the natural world, learning to plant seeds. How many seeds fit into this bed? Harvesting food out of the ground, being in the kitchen, what it is, a quarter of a cup, a teaspoon, a half a cup. This is how they learn maths, through practical learning. This is how they connect with what feeds life. This is how they connect to how to feed themselves, how to shelter themselves, how to make themselves warm, what goes into creating clothes, what goes into all the different process that actually support life. Where are you happiest? Are you happiest digging a hole and building a, you know, a, fair, um, a fairy house outside? or sitting watching the TV. Yes, my children love TV. They love TV because they're only allowed to watch TV on the weekends. There was no TV on whatsoever during the week in the house. They had to get outside and do something creative. So it's this connection to the natural world and the willingness to be different. My children were taught to use pocket knives when they were early. And when we killed rabbits on the farm, they they learned what was the heart and what was the kidneys. And, you know, like, it, you know, to me, it, it felt a little uncomfortable. I wanted to protect them from something that felt perhaps a little sad. But children don't experience things this way when there is a reverence to it. I never forget my sister telling me that one of her friends wouldn't tell her children where meat came from. It just came in a packet from the supermarket because she was so scared of upsetting them in them understanding that it comes from animals. This is the disconnection. It's not about shaming. It's not about um, making people wrong. It is about understanding. When we understand our place in the natural world it all makes sense it all makes sense and when we look at it all through a lens of love through a lens of reverence and awe and wonder then it makes sense because we can't destroy something we love i am so so thrilled to introduce you to today's guest. Cynthia, are you there, honey? I think you are. Yep, I am here. How are you? So well, so well. Thank you so much for being with us. Cynthia, I am not entirely sure how to pronounce your surname, so I'll let you tell <laughs> us. Soska, is it? It's Soska, yeah. Soska, close. 
<laughs> so I came across Cynthia very recently. We are in the same um, coaching program. And in watching Cynthia's posts come through, I was so inspired to reach out and connect because I love everything that you stand for. So Cynthia is, I, I wrote a couple of notes. Um, Oh, now I've just flipped my pages over. You've got a degree in environmental resources science and a certified huh. permaculture designer. So, Cynthia, what I would love to do as a starting point, um, there are going to be women um, in our audience that haven't come across you until now. So if you could just give us a little background into, first of all, where are you on our lovely planet and how did you come to be doing the work that you're doing now? Yeah, um, so I am in Northern California in the U.S., so um, yeah, it's, uh, I've been in the U.S. my whole life, uh, you know, I've moved around from state to state, but been, been here pretty much my whole life um, and visited outside of the U.S. very rarely. So <laughs> I don't have a lot of experience outside the U.S. Um, the way I came to permaculture was kind of a roundabout fashion, actually. I started off um, as a tree hugger since I was a little, a little girl, like six years old, worried about the planet, um, trying to save the earth. I, I really thought like, man, things are not going well and I need to, I need to do everything I can. So I'm going to recycle because I thought that was the way that we were going to save the earth. Um, and it just, it just went from there. I eventually, I went to college and I got my degree, like you said, in environmental resource science. And I even worked at the recycling um, center in college <laughs> because I wanted to help them. It wasn't very glamorous. It was a lot of digging through garbage cans and pulling out the recyclables. So it was pretty gross work actually. <laughs> yeah. um, and then uh, I, I became a biologist and I started working in the field. I did a lot of surveys um, for endangered species, that sort of thing, to try and help save their habitat. And then I decided I wanted to have kids. And so I chose to come in out of the field because field work is, it's tough on your body. And when you're walking around in high grass with rattlesnakes and you're doing surveys at night with the mountain lions and things like that, I just was uncomfortable being pregnant and having that job. So I decided to come in out of the field. And at that time I ended up working as a planning technician. And so I got into the IT industry basically where I started working with all kinds of different software and learning how to code and all these crazy things. <laughs> and then, um, I say probably three years ago, it was during COVID. I just was really like, you know, I really got to get back to the earth. Like I know I'm here for a reason. And I, I know that I was on this path and I got off of it. And that was years, years ago. And I really wanted to get back on my path. And I had a friend who was practicing permaculture and he had this great design on his property. He had tons of fruit trees, mm -hmm. um, a great annual garden, chickens, cows, all, you know, all the things. Um, and we talked about how he didn't know much about permaculture when he did it. And so he thought, well, I would do this a lot differently if I had known then what I know now. And so that like really inspired me like, well, what, how is it, how is permaculture different than what you've already done here? Cause what he has is so great. And so I started really um, learning more about it. And then that's when I decided I was going to start practicing on my own property. And so I, I did, I started in zone one, which is basically just outside the home. Uh, the home itself is zone zero and um, did that for three years. And then I, you know, after a couple of years, I was like, wow, this is really great. I want to get certified in it because I want to take it further. And so I ended up getting certified last year and um, I've been doing it ever since. And that's why I started working with other people, other clients to help them create their own plans for themselves. Because I really think that permaculture is it sounds like a new thing, but it's not necessarily new. If you look at the way uh, indigenous people lived or you know, Native Americans, this is how they lived. 
and it is the philosophy that they lived by. There's an epic system, earth care, people care, fair share in that order. So earth always comes first. And that is how they lived, right? Because they knew that taking care of the earth meant taking care of them because the earth is our home. And if we destroy our home, we have no place to live. So um, it's really not a new concept. It just has a new name. Um, But I was really... I was really close to it. Like it felt like home in my heart. And so that's why what drew me to it and what made me really, you know, decide I'm, I'm going to get certified in this so that I can teach other people how to do it so that together we can create a better world. Basically. It's, you know, it always fascinates me because I think about, you know, when we say something like when we um, I'm just trying to think exactly what the line was that you use, but it's, you know, it's earth first, and mm-hmm. it is in our disconnection from this that, you know, when, when you say it in such a simple sentence, it's so obvious that <laughs> this is our home, you know, this is our home. And when we think about the idea of punching holes in our walls or slowly burning, you know, <laughs> the, the physical home that we live in, it's horrifying. And yet we mm-hmm. don't really apply that same logic to our beautiful planet and there's so many examples of how we just take this for granted. So this whole series really is just about the time to pause and reconnect to, to that understanding again. So I have I have understanding particularly of biodynamics and I would love a deeper understanding of what permaculture is as a difference. So what is permaculture for those that don't know? Yeah, so um, it's actually... It's hard to describe, but the the most the easiest definition to give is it's a combination of permanent agriculture and permanent culture together. So permanent agriculture meaning perennials, not annuals. So fruit trees, nut trees, asparagus, artichokes, sunchokes, those things that are perennials that you don't dig up. They 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 stay there and they just keep growing and growing and growing. You can have an asparagus plant that will live 20 years. So, um, you, and the the beauty of it is you don't have to keep sowing the seed, right? The, the, the roots just get stronger and stronger and stronger, and they just keep producing better and better and better for you as time goes on. And the amount of work that you have to do is all upfront, right? So there is some maintenance involved, but it's not like I have to dig a hole. I have to put the tree in. I have to put all the right amendments in. It's not like that. It's like, okay, I've put the tree in and now I just have to give it some water and make sure that there's no bugs on it <laughs> basically right so permanent agriculture we're not hunter gatherers anymore we're we're putting our our stake in the ground and saying this is where we're going to create our food so that we don't have to move around anymore yep. um, and then permanent culture meaning we take that that permanent agriculture and we create a community around it So now we have maybe not just one family living on a homestead, but we might have multiple families. So more of like commune style where everybody is sharing, like everybody's creating their own food and we're all now sharing the food that we create. You grow oranges and I grow apples and then I give you some of my apples and you give me some of your oranges. So basically a permanent community. So people are not necessarily like, um, you know, like we would call someone a gypsy who is, you know, and I don't even know if that's the a proper term or if that's even PC to say these days, but, um, you know, like someone who goes from place to place and doesn't really stay in one spot. So we're talking about permanent agriculture, people who want to stay in one spot and create a community of people where we all work together and um, for the same goals, you know, we all think earth first and then people care and then fair share, meaning everybody gets their fair share of the pie basically <laughs> we we share and if there's anybody who doesn't who, who needs something that doesn't have it we give to that person because it's all about taking care of our community basically yeah. so it's the combination of those two things really so um there is food production is a major component of it but it's not all about food production there's actually 12 principles of permaculture that that include food production, but it's, it's varied. It's it's quite wide. Yeah. Yeah, So you plant woodlots for 
for wood for fire and and so on it's mm-hmm. like different I've I've got memories I I think you know I remember seeing a Bill was it Bill Mollison Is that- yep he's the founder that yeah. or the he's the one who created the word permaculture so yeah. he yeah as a as a visionary his work sticks in my mind because I can see kind of like the map process it of the way that he had things so you have you know things have very specific areas and um, I love that idea of having you know not just a a blueprint for a house that you're going to build but it extends out into the um, the area around you so a lot of the people that are tuning into this are going to have very small gardens or maybe even just balconies how do we is there a is there a process to applying this to very small um, in a city or suburban areas as well? Yeah, actually. And uh, it's actually one of the things that I love the most, because I think when you're trying to apply permaculture to a really large piece of property, it can get really overwhelming. Um, and even so, even on a large property, a majority of the property is going to be zone five, which is forested land, which you don't touch. You, you really just use it for observation. You might go out into the forest and look around and, and see what do I see happening in nature that I can recreate in my space over here where I'm growing, right? Because the idea is to model nature. So the way things grow in nature, you might have a large oak tree and then under that you might have a couple of shrubs and then you might have a vine growing up the tree. So that, that modeling is what we use in permaculture and we call it a guild. So in, in permaculture, you would have, there's, there's seven layers. You would have the top story is the the big tree, which might be a fruit tree, might be a cherry tree, for instance. And then you might have, um, some onions, you might have some garlic, you might have some daffodils to keep the bugs away. You might have, um, some chives and you might even have like, um, like a mulberry bush underneath it. So it's like this this family of plants that go together, that work really well together, that don't compete with each other, but they actually enhance the growing um, situation, right? So either they're they're getting rid of the competition, like getting rid of the, the bugs, or they're bringing in the good bugs that eat the bad bugs, <laughs> or um, yeah. So basically that is, the idea. So when we bring that from a large property into a small property on a balcony, you might have a single pot, for instance. So you might have a tomato growing in a large pot, and then you might plant some basil around it. So the basil that you plant underneath it on the bottom is going to keep the hornworms from totally destroying your tomatoes, right? Because they don't really like the basil. And so they'll tend to stay away from it. Or you can plant things like nasturtium or um, I'm blanking on the name of the other one, the golden flower. Marigold, is it? Yes, marigold. Thank you. You can plant marigolds and that'll bring in the beneficial insects that will come and eat the aphids because aphids love just about everything in an annual garden. (laughs) So these are annuals that I'm talking about, but you can do the same thing with perennials. Like for instance, I have a couple of blueberries in bins on my deck because I, I have a really very sloped property. Like the slope is extreme. And in permaculture, you don't generally create swales or plant anything that's above a 20% slope. You leave it forested. And the majority of my property is above 20% slope. So I really just have like my deck space and then a couple of areas here and there where I've got some fruit trees. Um, So on my deck, I have these big bushels, blueberry bushes, and then I have growing underneath them either clover, which will um, fix nitrogen and provide nitrogen to the plant. And other one, I have um, strawberries growing underneath because they, they require, they have similar soil requirements and they don't compete with one another. So companion planting is probably something you've heard of. And so it's, it's along those lines when you're talking about a deck space, right? You're, you're, you can still create these guilds of sorts where you can combine multiple plants in one large pot, 
-hmm. that are beneficial and helpful for each other. And they don't compete. You know, they, they have the same soil requirements, the same water requirements, and one can help the other as far as pests go. So it, it can be done on a deck. And like I said, I'm doing it and it's, it's mm -hmm. fabulous to have a blueberry bush that just keeps growing year after year after year. And of course you have to plant them in kind of large pots so that they've got some room to expand and grow. Um, and they're not going to get as big as they would if they were in the ground, but for sure you can still, it's, I mean, you can do it on a patio. You could do it on a deck. Even if you had a little teeny tiny patio in the city, you could still practice permaculture there. I've and in fact, had, I've never had luck with blueberries. Raspberries. Oh, really? We've actually got strawberries that just started ripening yesterday, but um, because we're our season's opposite to yours, but um, right. yeah, I, I've never had luck with blueberries. They need acid, don't they? Acid soil. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe but uh, strawberries, strawberries do too. Um, so they, they both should do well together. It might just be the, um, it might just be the, I don't know what your freeze level is, like how, how long you have cold weather for and what the freeze yeah. point is. And no, no freeze level here. What's no freeze. Rich. Oh, okay. Okay. No. Yeah. So I would have to look it up to be sure, but yeah, I mean, it, it's probably something more along the lines of that. Yeah. Yeah. No, we just stay sort of kind of cold and then we have a little bit of warm and then <laughs> very okay. I guess it's temperate we're right yeah. right on the ocean but um yeah we're where we did have a farm in an area that had freezing you know like thick frost and cold not snow but frost and you know getting out coming out to take the kids to school in the morning and having to hose down the windscreen so you could see out the windscreen and then the tap wouldn't turn on because everything was frozen I have lived in that before <laughs> yeah yeah we we have snow here so it gets mm -hmm. really cold and yeah. And the blueberries, I leave them outside. I don't bring them in and they survive the winter. Um, so they, they do good yeah. here. I have a very um, romantic view of living in the snow. I always think I'd love to, but I don't know about the reality. <laughs> I think a lot of people do. <laughs> it's, it's fun when it's a little bit of snow. Where I live right now is just a little bit of snow, but there are some places north of here that get quite a bit of snow that I would not want to live in because it's just you're constantly shoveling or you yeah. just have so much snow on your roof that you know it's it's a problem yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm happy. Um, if, I've got a, if I've got a set of skis I'll be happy <laughs> yeah right yeah um, I was going to mention one thing there is there is actually a way to apply permaculture to business as well so permaculture, the principles that we use can be applied to many different things. Yeah. And so, you know, when you're talking about earth care, people, people care, fair share, you can apply that to your business, meaning like earth has a voice or a seat at the table in your business. Yeah. So I think that's really interesting. And then also like um, utilizing renewable energy is one of the principles. So in your business, you can make sure that you're using renewable energy and your manufacturing, for instance, if you have a product or something like that, um, or if you're selling soap or something like that, you know, you can make sure that the, you're not using plastic in your product packaging or your shipping, things like that. So permaculture, mm -hmm. it's very wide and varied. It's not, it's not just, you know, what, what most people think of when they think of permaculture, I think is food production, but it's, yeah, it covers a lot of things. Yeah. I just wrote down earth has a seat at the table. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. It just, yeah. It's, it's just a fabulous reminder in how we make every decision. Yeah. yeah I love it. Um, so you've touched on the idea that, you know, it covers a wide variety of, of philosophies and ways of living, but maybe if you give us just some permaculture principles that you use in your daily life, um, it will give the audience some, some takeaways that they can use from this as well. Yeah, yeah, of course. So one of the principles that I, I try my best to follow every day is produce no waste. So it's very difficult to do. There's all, it seems like there's always trash, but the idea is to, 
to produce as little waste as possible. So bringing reusable cups wherever you go. So you're not ever, you know, getting that single use cup. You're not, you don't have a single use straw. I have like a little um, bamboo set of silverware that I keep in my purse. So when I eat out, I use that, you know, I don't use the plastic fork or whatever that they're going to hand me. Um, I always take my food scraps and I put them in like a reusable container or like an old lettuce container. <laughs> and I, I put that in the refrigerator and I keep that there until I'm ready to put it into my worm bin. So I have a worm bin where I feed them all, all of my scraps from, you know, fruits and vegetables. I don't, I don't feed them citrus and I don't feed them onions, meat or cheese, but if it's a fruit or a vegetable, I typically put it in there and I've been feeding that thing for years and I have yet to fill it up. They just eat and eat and eat and they create basically gold. <laughs> they create amazing compost um, or worm castings, which is, you know, <laughs> the result of them eating. Uh, and then we put that in the garden and it's really healthy for the plants and, and growing. So that's, that's the, the main principle that I'm constantly thinking about every day. How can I produce less waste? How can I recycle something even, you know, in the recycling arrow, right? It's reduce reuse, then recycle. Recycling is actually the very last thing you want to do. And you don't want to have to recycle if you don't have to. So, um, I have a beneficial human workshop and the tagline is stop recycling and become a beneficial human instead, <laughs> because people think that recycling is like, and I did as a child, I thought recycling was going to save the world, but people think that it is actually doing more than it is. And they don't realize that a ton of the stuff that we think we're recycling is actually not being recycled and it's winding up in other countries and it's winding up in the waterways. And it's just crazy. I mean, if you've seen any of those kinds of documentaries, plastic wars, it's, it's crazy where our stuff ends up. Um, so that's the big one. I'm always trying to reduce first and then reuse. If I can't reduce it, then reuse it. And then if I can't do either of those, then I'm recycling it. So Unfortunately, I still do recycle <laughs> because I haven't been able to reduce everything, but I, I do as much as I can. Yeah, I, you know, I think recycling has been labeled the gold standard of contribution to, to helping the environment. And so it's really interesting to have that reframe as it's actually kind of down the bottom of the list. It's still important, but not. Yeah, for sure. Or the gold standard. Yeah. 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 The other things, um, you know, one of the values is use and value renewable resources. So having solar on your roof or getting a hybrid vehicle or an electric vehicle, those are easy ways that you can put that principle into place in your everyday life. You don't necessarily have to grow your own food, but you can have solar. Or for me, I don't actually have solar panels on my roof. I have... Um, pg and &E, I don't know what you guys have over there, but it's a, our electric company and you can actually choose the alternative energy plan. And you can say, I want all my energy to come from solar. Yeah. So it's like a, a plan that you subscribe to. And then the energy that they provide you comes from solar, <laughs> hopefully, right? Like I'm trusting that they're creating solar energy for me, for my use. Um, and so there's things like that, but there's also things like uh, purchasing credits, like climate credits. If you drive more than you want to, and you don't have an electric vehicle yet, you can actually like purchase credits. Um, and I, you know, I would definitely say like buy an electric vehicle before you do that. But if you can't buy an electric vehicle yet and you want to offset your carbon footprint, you can do something like that. So that's a really good um a really good thing to do. I have a, a hybrid vehicle and well, I have two hybrid vehicles. So <laughs> um, one of them I can plug in and the other one I can't, but so yeah. And those are, those are some other ways. I'm trying to think of what another one might be. Um, oh, use and value diversity. That's a really good one. So we think of diversity in terms of people a lot, but in terms of planting, diversity is hugely beneficial. So part of the problem with 
agriculture today is we've got these monocrops everywhere. And when some pest comes in, it will wipe out the whole crop because it just goes from plant to plant to plant because it's, it's like a smorgasbord for the pest, right? Like they're happy, like all these things here and I, and I can eat them all versus, you know, I ate this plant and then I went to the next plant and something different and I don't eat that plant. So now I'm kind of stuck here in this little spot. So diversity really helps with the ability to not only fight off pests, but also like in, in climate change or um, just weather related patterns, like some plants will hold up better than others. And so if you've got all of one type of plant and the freeze comes and kills everything, you're basically done. But if you've got 30 different kinds of plants and the frost comes and only kills five of them, then you've still got the others left, right? So diversity is really, and and if you look at nature, there is no monocrop in nature. It doesn't even exist. It's not possible because everything is connected. Everything works together with one another, right? So what we're trying to model is nature because nature knows best that's literally how the planet was created and anytime you try to get away from that natural diversity and abundance you're fighting nature basically (laughs) and and fighting nature is kind of useless because it will always win (laughs) yeah Yeah. I um I'm wondering you so you do one-on-one consultations with people if they if they Mm -hmm. want to get up a plan to make a start what's the best way for people to find you if they're interested yeah. so um my instagram account if you just go you can just type in cynthia sasta cynthia sasta in instagram and you'll see all of my different channels they do many different things but if you want to get straight to the permaculture channel you can just type in gaia's underscore permaculture and that's gaia's with an s g a i a s underscore permaculture and that'll take you straight to my Instagram account and you can just message me directly from there. Um, or you can click on the link and it'll take you to my schedule and you can just pick your own appointment time. Basically it's a three, a free 30 minute consultation where we talk about kind of what you've got going on on your property, um, what your plans are, what your dreams and desires are. And then, um, whether, and then we talk about whether or not I can help you create that. Like if I think, a uh, permaculture would be a really good idea for your site and if I can create a plan for you and then that's basically it and then I come out and do a site visit when you're ready and we go from there (laughs) it might be a little challenging to come to Australia although you're very welcome (laughs) yeah but I guess that's a burning question for for a lot of my audience is in Australia and the people in the UK and other places so you still I mean what you offer you could do it like virtual kind of mapping and planning and support yeah so it's possible to do it virtually depending on like what uh, mapping is available in your area so you know I I rely on the county's maps and google and um, certain sites that give me the the information that I need because about 75 percent of the, the work that I do is research about the particular property and all the things the sun the wind the rain, where the fire is going to come from, where the wind is every month of the year, right? So there's a lot of research that has to be done. And the majority of that can be done for any site. The only, the the hard parts about being on site are like the measurements and knowing exactly what the measurements are of the house. In general, if you don't have a ton of tree cover, I can get it from Google. Um, And if that's not available, we can pay somebody to do to fly a drone over your property and then give me the measurements so it still can be done virtually it's just a little bit different and the cost is a little bit more because we got to fly the drone um, and pay somebody to do that but but it can be done yeah and for people that have just got a sort of a smaller suburban lot or even a balcony there's you could do a plan um yeah beautiful yeah and that would be easy. We wouldn't need a lot of the same things because if you've just got this one area, it kind of is what it is and you don't have to do as much of the research because you are you know where you're going to put it. There's no question of like, well, where should I put my chicken coop or where should I put the pond or do I need it down here? You know, like a lot of the, the big things you don't have to worry about. So it's, it's the less work. Yeah. 
Beautiful. Thank you so much for your time and sharing so generously. You've given us so much information to make a start with. If you want to send me the, the best links for people to connect with you, I'll send it out in the replay email um, so that they can okay. get you these. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. And this evening, we have the very gorgeous Inara Griffin coming in to join us. And that's a completely different and delicious conversation. So I hopefully I will see you all again this evening. All right, that's it from me today. So much love. And bye for now.